Good day and welcome to the Elite Performance Team Podcast. Thanks for listening. The EPT Podcast is produced weekly for your enjoyment by Dominic Grillo and Dr. Jan Kastowitz. Today we have a special guest by the name of Mary Ellen Loranger on our podcast. We'll start with the quote of the day. Quote of the day. So many people spend their health gaining wealth and then spend their wealth trying to regain their health. Doc. Any comments on Yeah, we have a couple of those, uh, those patients here in our office uh, that hustle, and I used to be in the same boat too. Um, been in this practice for six years, and um, due to some family circumstances, uh, I was working like seven days a week from like October through probably the end of April for like three years. So I was pulling seven days a week for about six months. Then, yeah, you know, financially it was great, you know, at that was creating some independence, which, you know, I'm not going to say it was a bad idea, but at the same time, um, physically healthy, I was still good, but my mental health was, oh boy, my anxiety was going through the roof because I was basically building this neurological loop, like I got to be in the office, I got to be in the office, I got to have people come in to the point where I would, I would finish my six month stint, literally working every day, and then try to enjoy summer where I basically train my brain, like I gotta be in the office. So when I, I wasn't able to relax. So um, this year I've had uh, some clients and some patients reach out to me and they're like, yeah, let me know when you have Saturday hours again. And I'm like, yeah, I'm never working on Saturday again. You know, my Saturdays will be doing workshops. My Saturdays will be hanging out with Dom doing workshops. We're gonna be doing some cycling stuff. We're all about to do some snowshoeing and stuff. When it snows and hanging out with my wife, hanging out with my niece, my nephew, go and see their sporting events because that's the thing. So you can go ahead and work as hard as you can and gain all this wealth or whatever you're trying to gain. But once your health starts getting affected, it's the most difficult thing to ever get back is your health. Gaining a couple pounds is one thing, but once you start having cardiovascular issues, that's extremely difficult to get out of, especially if you have other things, other priorities as well. How about yourself, Mary? Do you have any experience with Absolutely. I uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm not sure I can even comment on anything because I'm in these amazing recovery booths. Um, I'm just loving it right about now. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I think it's look. I, I recently left a um, a career to, to kind of do my own business, start my own business, and one of the biggest issues I have is time blocking. Um, I find myself working really from sun up to sundown and not really blocking out that those hours to spend with my husband, my kids, my dog, um, and really just taking time for myself other than my training, which is going on right now. So I love that concept that, you know, yeah, could you work Saturday hours? You definitely could, but um, quality of life is gonna make you a better practitioner. It's gonna make you a better, uh, it's gonna be able to, you know, you're gonna be able to service your clients better. So that's what I find too. If you're not carving out that, that quality time and that time blocking, just going to run yourself into a hole um, and that's going to serve no one so I'm, I'm a bit I'm, I'm not great at that I definitely have to be better at that but I am working towards towards that every single day very good so tell us a little bit about yourself sure so um, I just turned 50 and proud of it I feel amazing I feel like I'm in my 30s I am blessed with the most amazing husband in the world Wayne um, who um, is the love of my life. Uh, it's our second marriage, and um, it took us a while to find each other, but we finally did, and um, it's the best. Uh, we love doing uh, triathlon and Ironman events together, and it's, uh, it's a nice little life that we have. We're also blessed to have seven kids between us. I have four, he has three. My kids range from uh, 21 down to 14, and Wayne has his children from 22 on down. Uh, to, to about uh, 18. So uh, we're busy. We're very, very busy. And we have um, our fur baby named Sarge, which we spend a lot of time with. And uh, he's our training partner. Um, and, you know, we, uh, we have a really great life. We live in Oakland, New Jersey. I grew up in Fairlawn, so I'm, I'm a Bergen County girl. I'm a Jersey girl through and through. And um, um, just blessed to be here today. Excellent. So as far as triathlons, Tell us some of the triathlons you've done in, in, up, up until this point. Oh my God, so sure. So the whole thing started back, I guess it was in 2010, 
somebody had asked me to be um, on a relay team at the Franklin Lakes Whitecock Triathlon. Um, I was a swimmer growing up and they needed a swimmer for the relay team and so that's where my journey began. Um, the national world championship. <laughs> The Bergen County National Championships, as it as it was known, yes. One of the most competitive races. Yeah, you know, here. I was just talking about that. It true, it really is true. It's still the tracks a very tough crowd, um, but that's how I started. And then I'm a very competitive person by nature, and I said, well, I think I can do the rest of this. I wasn't a runner in any way, shape, or form, and I certainly wasn't a biker. And so I think a couple weeks later, I borrowed somebody's mountain bike and competed in an all, all women uh, triathlon in Morris. County, New Jersey, and I came in first in my age group on this mountain bike that weighed um, probably double my, my, you know, was you know, like 200 pounds and just ridiculous. Um, and so the rest is history. So I quickly um, did a little bit, a few more Olympic distance races, the New Jersey State Olympic, which is one of my favorites. Um, Red Bank had this amazing Olympic distance race, which is no more. And then I was swimming in the Y one day, and somebody said, well, we should do Eagle Man. And I said, well, what's an Eagle Man? I had no idea what it was, and it was a half Ironman event. And so that was my first entry into the endurance distance type races, and that was in 2011, so one year later. And then from there, I uh, signed up for the 2012 Ironman, which came to New York City, which was the one and only one in New York City. It was called the US Championships. And I am so grateful for that event because that got me into Ironman and a bunch of us from the area signed up for that. And then from there, I went on to do Lake Placid Ironman uh, three times. Um, I was grateful to go to the US World Championships last year, which is a whole nother story. And going back this year in about five weeks to apply. For those of you that don't know, Eagle Man is in Cambridge. Cambridge, Maryland. yep, and Maryland, yeah. yeah. And um, it is notoriously hot. hot. Notorious, and, and a very, very tough. Yeah. Although a flat course, a very tough course. Yep. Um, so I was there, I believe, in 2012 or yeah. 15. I don't remember the exact year. Yeah. Um, speaking on the the New York City Ironman, I mean, that's just an event that'll go down in it, history. It, it was. It was really. When we think about Ironman, it was not the typical Ironman because there was really no village. There was no hoopla. We literally parked our bikes in Fort Lee, and we ended the race in um, Riverside Park, I believe it was. And, you know, we ran over the Hudson Bridge. The, the run course was ridiculous in, um, you know, in, in Fort Lee there. It was really tough. The bike was, like, up and down. I think it was the Palisades Parkway. I mean, it was ridiculous. But you know what? It was the best experience ever, and that's sort of what my appetite for what would lead to um, a nice little side hobby. <laughs> So, excellent, cool. excellent. Cool. And the world championship. Yeah. I mean, which which race are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. So I know. You know, I feel almost a little, and I'm I, I'm I'm very truthful in everything I say. I'm, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed that I got to go, and now especially since I'm going back this year. So this is the U.S. World Championship in Kona, Hawaii, which the best of the best athletes get to go to that, and really. The way that you get to go to that is to qualify um, in your age group at another iron distance race. Um, I did not obviously get to go in that way, but I went as an ambassador for a women's triathlon organization last year. I raised over $40,000 for the organization, and I went and I raced on their behalf, and it was incredible. incredible. So you put a lot of work into it. Oh my God. And well deserved. Yeah. Congratulations <laughs> it was, for it the was, first time, and, and best of luck to you yes. as you're going. Thank you. So tell us about your your fitness mm. now, and and how you came into sort of into your adulthood with children. Yeah, yeah. So I've always been an athlete my whole life. Uh, I was a swimmer, competitive swimmer, and softball player, and um, you know, fitness was always a part of my life. Um, and so having kids, I sort of put that on the back burner. And then when my third child was born. I said, well, let me, I need to go start doing something again. And so I, you know, I simply started by pushing, like my kids are close together, so I started pushing them in this insanely, ridiculously heavy double stroller up and down the hills where we lived. And because I am a little nutty, that then led to running with the stroller. And then one thing led to another. Um, I really got the fitness bug, decided to become a group fitness instructor, got certified for that. Um, and it was something I could do when my kids were little, when I was home with them. So I did that on the side. And, um, 
I think fitness and motherhood is essential. I think it made me a better mother because, again, it kind of equipped me with the tools I needed to, to be a young mom and to deal with the young kids. And, um, and, and then, you know, as they got a little bit older, I was looking for a little bit more, and I started running. I was not a runner. I, I really don't even consider myself still a runner, but um, I started parking my car at the bottom of this long hill, and I would run up this hill, and I think it was barely a mile to the gym. And that's how I started running. And then I said, well, I think I can go a little bit further and a little bit further. And then the next thing you know, I'm running the New York City Marathon. So that's how the whole thing started um, with endurance races and, and then my entry into the triathlon world um, from there. So, Very, good. Yeah. Very good. Do you look at fitness as a training tool? As, as, a, as, a, sorry, as, a, as a weight loss tool? Um, I, I used to. And I think that, um, look, I think exercise and fitness is part of every healthy lifestyle. It, it has to be. But I think it's more critical for maintaining weight loss. Um, for me, I always exercised, but my nutrition wasn't always as on point. And while I would never miss a swimming, biking, or running, or a weightlifting session, I wasn't the same, um, I didn't have the same diligence when it came to my, my food and my nutrition. And so I would oftentimes go out on these long bike rides, but come home and eat the house out. And you know, it didn't always work for me. You know, for some it could work. You know, men have a little bit of a different, um, you know, makeup that some, some, something like that would work for them, but it didn't work for me. And there were many years training for Ironman, I actually gained weight and it was so depressing because here I was killing myself and yet I felt like I was not looking my best. So I really um, buttoned my nutrition up this year. That's made a little bit of a difference for me. And, in losing weight and keeping my weight off, and I, I think it's really 80, 80, 20. You know, they say it's 80, 20, but I, I feel like I've recently proven that. Um, I know now that I can manipulate my weight with my food, um, and the exercise helps me maintain my weight loss. But yeah, it's okay. it's, it's very interesting that that you, you speak this way after the conversation we literally had prior to getting on this podcast. Yeah. So I have a similar story. I gained five pounds training for the. City oh my God! Really? Which which I couldn't believe. And Doc, you made a comment this morning about getting lean and gut health. So would you mind? Yeah, I'm glad you bring this up because um, we come across a lot of people, especially when, like we're talking about triathletes. You're running, you're swimming, and you're cycling. You burn an enormous amount of calories. So if you're focusing on purely calorie in and calorie out, you shouldn't be overweight. You should be hit your your gain weight. You know your racing weight. It's much more complex than that. So I try to focus on, personally, I would say a vegetarian for like a year and a half. My niece and my nephew thought it was horrible because although I was eating fish too, every time they come over, they don't know I have a fish clock. So um, I was vegetarian for about a year and a half. I was vegan for about half a year. Then I, um, now more or less, um, I'm omnivore, which means I eat everything. But I eat kind of like where my genes are from. I'm a whole fish, so I'm a Eastern European, eat a lot of farm from that area. But I noticed that a lot of people who, will, who I work with, some of our patients and clients, they look at exercise as their excuse to eat crap. You know, and don't get me wrong, I've mentioned on previous podcasts, like every other Saturday, or I have like five slices of pizza. I generally really enjoy pizza. And it's one thing, you know, it keeps me sane as sane, so I'm gonna have my pizza, but when I'm trying to thin down, just like Mary's saying, I know what I need to do. And it, the most important thing I've done recently where I'm looking like, wow, I kind of, you know, I wasn't exactly keyed in on my nutrition the last week and a half, but I've been very keyed in on my gut health. And I can't explain enough how important GI health is. It's making sure you have a, you propagate a lot of good, healthy bacteria in your gut, not just for digestion and absorption of nutrients, but uh, we've also mentioned in previous podcasts with uh, mental disease and things of that nature, depression, anxiety. The majority of all of your neurotransmitters are created in your gut. And actually, your gut has more nerve endings than your actual brain does. So they actually consider your brain and your gut, they work together. And the other thing that you have to also understand, out of 100% of DNA in your body, only 2% of that DNA is human DNA. The other 98% is other organisms, mostly in your gut. So when we look at it, Take a step back, we're literally just a bag of skin, which is a house for other organisms. So by taking in good, healthy bacteria, eating really good sources of fiber to feed 
that back to you, creating a nice um, environment where you have lots of different various types of that bacteria, you're going to function better. People who cannot lose weight, they don't have diverse bacteria, they have very limited bacteria. So what you need to do, you need to start adding in more fermented foods, you need to do things like beer, you can do pickles, you can do sauerkraut, you can do uh, kombucha, things of that nature will go ahead and create an environment and populate your gut with healthy bacteria, making weight loss and cognitive function much more efficient. Doc, thank you so much for that. That was that's real important. Thank you. Mary Ellen, yes. you are busy. Yeah. We know this. Yes. You are the, the starter of the New Jersey Tribe Friends. Yeah. You uh, you work, you you have a family, you have kids, Sarge, your dog. Yeah. How do you fit this all in? Um it's all about priorities, right? And so I am an early morning wake up person. I've been notoriously waking up between 4 and 4.30 a.m. I um, set time aside to get my water in, my nutrition, my gratitude journal, and then I'm off of training before the day begins. For me, that's the only way I can get it done. And I, when I leave workouts to the end of the day, it often doesn't get done or it gets shortened. And so for me, that's my quality time. I know I can have a really good workout at that point, gets my training in, um, I can be on point with it. I have the most energy, I'm a morning person. And so I've always done my workouts early morning. If I have to do a two a day, sometimes I'll sneak out at lunchtime and do that. But at the end of the day, I like to meal prep, I like to be there for my kids, I like to be there for my husband. It's sort of an unwinding time. So I very rarely save my stuff to the end of the day. Morning. It's but very smart and uh, Dr. Janet, I are, are exactly the same. I struggled with sleep for a lot of years of my life, uh, that of the post-traumatic stress. I, I, I honestly didn't sleep for, for several years. So now, if I don't have to wake up, and, and we start, today we didn't, I didn't have to be here until 12 o'clock, I, I, I set an alarm to get my kids off to school, but if I don't have to, I now take that priority because sleep is definitely Absolutely. important for me. Um, but only because I had that issue for so long in my life. Right. Dr. Jen is up every day by 4.30 a.m. Doc, want to speak on that? Well, it's huge because uh, a lot of times people say, we all have 24 hours in the day. People say that we um, just don't have time to put it in. We got time for Netflix. You know? <laughs> got time for Facebook. We got time for Facebook. We got time for all these things. So I tell them, like, wake up early. My mommy's Facebook page is for like, the Morning Miracle, which is a fantastic book. Mm. So it tells you about when you wake up in the morning, you meditate, you write your gratitude journal, you do your affirmations and I'm checking out, you know, I'm not trolling the page, but I'm just looking at the page of people like they're trying to combine eating their cereal and then also reading. No, 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 you're not being present. So the only way to be present is to wake your ass up earlier so that you can do all these things and you're not multitasking. Absolutely. Some people are okay with multitasking, but with the majority of the population, humans totally suck at multitasking. One thing, you do it well, now you start to the project. When you're doing too many things, I think they said the brain can only focus on three tasks. And then throw in there being a mom, being a career, and then also training. You're only, the only way to do is the way the world. Well, I also feel like it sets your intentions for the day. When you can kind of start your day early, have time to yourself, do your gratitude journal, get your goals, you know, do your to-do list. It sort of sets, your, sets you on a right time frame for the day. And, just talking about sleep, I also feel the priority at night too. You know, for example, I was out Saturday night at a, a girls' night, um, which I still try to go to. I don't want to be a complete hermit, but I was. It was approaching 10 o'clock, and I was literally almost convulsing in fear because I had to wake up to run 18 miles the next day. And I'm thinking, I got to get out of here. So I, people know, do not text me after 8:30 at night. I'm usually in bed by nine. I'm in bed before my kids. I have to prioritize sleep because if I'm getting up that early every morning, I have got to get at least six, seven hours in. And I even sleep till eight hours sometimes. I feel that, especially as, you know, with the training and as I get older, uh, that is a priority for me to get my sleep. Doc, real quick, um, recovery with sleep. Can you comment on, on how important sleep is for recovery? It's absolutely huge. I mean, uh, no need to train hard. Um, training is good. Training will break your body down want to train to a point where you're forcing your body to go ahead to adapt to a new stress. But if you're not sleeping, there's two things that's not occurring. The body's not going to be able to adapt to that new stress because that's the only time your body heals. That's why I also recommend that when you're sleeping, you want to make sure you're getting quality sleep. It's also a good time to take in some kind of 
supplements. Uh, prior to going to sleep, I recommend essential amino acids because they provide building blocks of muscle. I also recommend taking the CBD product because the CBD product, like the Florence Blood Milk, what that will do, it downregulates everything. So it downregulates stress, anxiety, helps you sleep better as well. But the other, also the other important thing is when you sleep, that is the only time your brain gets to clean itself. So they've been showing with uh, studies recently coming out that the majority of the people who are coming down Alzheimer's with dementia, their brain's not cleaning itself because they're not getting enough sleep. I know some people, high-functioning professionals, that only sleep three hours a day. I mean, you can do that. There's a very small fragment of the population that can get away with that. But what happens when you sleep, your brain, your cerebral spinal fluid, which is fluid basically you can develop your brain and your spine, goes into the deep uh, crevices of your brain and cleans out this amyloid plaque, which, which occurs, which is what gives you uh, Alzheimer's. So if you're not getting enough sleep, your brain is not cleaning itself. So you can catch up on your sleep on the weekend, which is fine. But to sleep less than five to six hours a day, and eventually doing this every single day, and then let's say you have, you did 23 and which is a genetic test, you find out that you have a variant of Alzheimer's and now you're not sleeping more than five hours a day for 15, 20 years. Now you're putting yourself in a position where you shouldn't get Alzheimer's. And the thing is, it's not basically your, that fear you're going to suffer from, but it's the people that need to take care of that you do. So, sleep's huge. Thanks, Doc. Mary Ellen, can you tell us about your, your nutrition and how you yeah. refuel, especially training for yeah. the biggest Ironman yeah. event in the entire world? Um, so, I, I didn't always have the best habits. Um, I'm a huge believer now, uh, you know, again, just going back, I wasn't eating breakfast, I wasn't eating often enough. I wasn't drinking enough water, and especially as an athlete, I would, you know, start my day unfueled, dehydrated, and I was always chasing it. And so I would never think of getting in my car and driving down the block without fuel in the tank. And so why did I think I was any different? So what's changed for me is a, is a lot. So now I'm, I'm up early, I'm eating 30 minutes upon waking up, small little meals, about five times a day, I'm eating small little meals, never going longer than three hours without eating. I balance my, my carbs, my proteins, and my fats for each little meal. And again, that was the other thing I wasn't doing either. I wasn't eating any carbs at all. I was eating very little carbs, only in my vegetables. Now I'm eating moderate amounts of carbs, and it's really, my body's really responded to it, especially with the training. And then one or two times a day, I'm eating a larger meal, again, balancing my proteins, my fats, my my veggies, I weigh my protein out every single day. If I feel I need more, I up my protein. If I have a big training block, like this weekend I rode 100 miles and then I had an 18 mile run the following day and I needed more protein, so I just increased my protein. And so I was the type of person that would go all day long without eating. And I know, Dom, you do intermittent fasting and, 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 and that's awesome and there's so much benefit to that as well. But for me, I, I wasn't eating often enough to what I needed to do for me and everybody's different now that I'm eating you know more often little amounts the right amount I just I feel amazing and my training has been like through the roof in terms of that it's it's very important what you said there is not there is not a cookie cutter program here. right there is not and that exactly. and intermittent fasting works for me yeah. and, and I feel well on it uh, I'm completely fasted now it's uh, one o'clock Wow um, it does not work for everybody, and I'm a firm believer in that, I really am. Did you struggle with any uh, dietary <laughs> issues throughout your life? Oh my God, how much time do we have? No. <laughs> um, oh God, you name the, you know, and I, I look at diet now as a four letter word, but um, I, you name the diet, I did it. I was always chasing something. If you would say to me, Mary Ellen, what were you doing back in 2008? I could name the diet I was on. And the other day I was cleaning out my filing cabinet and drawer was stuck. I'm like, what is back here? I opened the drawer and it was this big, I don't even know, phone book size of a, a file folder of all the diets and paperwork and dittos and, you know, oh my gosh, I threw the whole thing in the garbage. So I was really obsessed. And, 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 and this whole thing sort of started, I guess, back in high school. Um, I was a swimmer and my coach mentioned an offhanded comment about me, you know, leaning out to get faster, and really the rest is history. It kind of set me into a downward spiral of um, uh, really 
years and years and years of binging and purging um, that really honestly carried me over into my 40s. And it was just this incredible vicious cycle that really tore my body apart. I'm sure I, I'm still not recovered from the damage, but um, you know, I guess it started as a, a response to my coach. And again, I'm not faulting the coach, it was my reaction to what, what, what he had said. Um, but that was a, a, a terrible battle. And so one of the things I love doing now with my business is working with these young girls who a lot of them struggle with the same issues I did, body image issues and, you know, not knowing portion sizes and beating themselves up and, you know, punishing themselves with food and being good or bad depending on what they ate and associated food being good or bad. And I did that for years. If I went off my quote unquote diet, I was a bad person. Um, if I stayed on track, I was a good person. And I would really associate my, the way I looked at myself in terms of that and how closely I was following a plan. And um, it just was, it tore me up for years, so. Uh, I, I like the comment you made about uh, macros and you were saying weighing your food. Yeah. Sometimes to get extreme results, you have to do extreme things. At first, it felt, does this feel diety? Is it? Can I do this for life? Now it's as part of my day as training and brushing my teeth. You know, in terms of waking up every morning, I down a 16 ounce bottle of cold water. It wakes me up. Water's a part of my day. Weighing my protein is a part of my day. Eating every two and a half to three hours is a part of my day. It's just like anything else. What do they say? 21 days to build a habit. 90 days to make it part of your lifestyle, or something along those lines. And it's the truth. You start doing it day after day after day and stay consistent. It just becomes habit and ritual. I don't even think of it as, oh God, I gotta take this protein out. It's right, the scale's right next to the stove. Two, one, two, three, it's just, and it just keeps me on track. Tremendous, Doc, any comments on, on your diet? Uh, yeah, pretty much I try to keep it clean. Um, I do intermittent fasting as well. I don't do it as frequently or as, as strictly as you do. I try to take the majority of my carbs in at the end of the day. So this way, uh, I, it's true, uh, anything you do eat will uh, spike your insulin, but I try to eat. First, I uh, try to work out in the morning. Every day I do exercise, which is like movement-based stuff, or do some uh, kettlebell swings, or things of that nature. Do some pull-ups there, get out on the bike, and do some actual training. And then when I get back in, I'll have like yogurt with a bunch of, uh, I'll have chia seed in there, black seed, or have broccoli seed sprouts in there, pumpkin seeds, macadamia nuts, and then I'll eat probably with some chicken and some coconut sauce my wife made and then later today that's when I'll have my carbohydrates before I go to sleep so this way I can uh, pop off my glycogen stores which is the fuel which is in your muscle my insulin spikes a little bit so this way it's going to make me sleepier and then this way yeah I'll be, sleep, I'll be sleeper when I need to sleep and then I'll take my CBD too prior to going to sleep too so this way I'm really in a good sleep and then I wake up in the morning the uh, fuel's popped off get on the bike and go ride so I like doing intermittent fasting. The thing is, I don't think, I'm not dogmatic with what I do. I do a lot, especially like in the, uh, there's a new carnivore diet out there where everybody just eats purely just meat. <laughs> it's very dogmatic, especially like the total counterculture, which is the vegan diet, where everybody's like focused purely on, you know, eating plants. I understand, I love animals, you know, I, I generally really love animals, but I do believe, you know, everybody has their own thing that works for them. When I was younger, I was a lot bigger, more muscular. I was really into like bodybuilding and things of that nature. So I was eating a lot more frequently. But now, especially with my schedule with that work, it's much more convenient for me to just try to go ahead and have two to three, actually maybe a five or six hour window for eating a good amount of healthy food and then fasting the rest of the day. But if I was home, it would probably be different. Yeah. Very good. Mary Ellen, tell us about mindset. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm a huge believer in mindset, and I do a lot of um, I do a lot of Facebook lives on this. Um, in February, I decided to go live every day and do a journey to gratitude. And every day, I went Facebook live and did a little tip on gratitude. Uh, mindset is just huge. And, and and just for a second, talking about from an athlete perspective, you do get this, the starting line of a race, and you are feeling confident, and feeling good, and feeling ready. That's 99.9% .9 of the battle, 110%. Because if you're feeling, I don't know, I mean, so many times I'd be on the shore looking at the water, I'm like, I 
don't know if I, I mean, no matter how many races I did, thinking, I don't know if I can do this, I mean, really? So I think mindset is so huge. And, you know, Henry Ford had this saying, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And I just love that. It's really about believing in yourself, and mindset is so important. And I work with so many people today, again, in weight loss or getting on a better eating habits or, you know, balancing out their nutrition. And it's almost to the T, the people who think they can and believe in themselves starting out, it's almost like the scale senses their positivity. Those that say, I don't know, I'm skeptical, I, I don't think I can do it, because maybe they've tried and failed so many times before and they don't believe in themselves, it's almost like they have a harder time and their body and mind have a harder time syncing up. But when you charge into something and say, I got this, I can do this, your mind says, all right, let's go, let's go do it. I think positivity and mindset in whatever we're doing, and especially as athletes, um, and again, I just want to say this one thing. For years, I was so not confident riding my bike. I remember joining my friends for a Saturday morning bike ride, dreading it the night before, dreading it. And you know what? It set me up for a shitty ride, excuse my expression, every single Saturday morning where I would throw my bike against the rough garage when I got home. Now, I look forward to my Saturday rides. I got this. It's all about mindset. I have great Saturday rides, and I enjoy the heck out of it. What's changed? Nothing really, except my mindset. So it's just such a big part of, of, of yeah, training. Mind, what color is your bike? Oh, <laughs> it's a pink. It's pink. It's pink. <laughs> it was, uh, I think it was maybe two years ago, maybe even last year. I was riding through Harvard State Park, which is a park that everybody pretty much rides through. And I'm doing pretty good. And then this pink, pink bike with his chick on, they're just passing me up. I'm like, oh crap. And then oh my I'm gosh. like, oh my god. And then I came, came to the office a couple days later. And then um, some disciples asked how your ride go. I'm like, it's great, but I got chicked like really bad with, with all due respect. That's so funny. And uh, <laughs> like, just, you got chicked by who? I'm like, I don't know, some chick in a pink white. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, it's probably married. Oh my gosh, right. pink made too fast. No, it's yeah. um, it's it's a great bike, and um, it's my favorite color, so it's sort of all comes together. You were just training for the turnaround. Wow. Yeah, That's yes, <laughs> yes, yes. That turnaround is. Special, I gotta tell you. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Doc, yeah. anything on mindset? Yeah, I totally agree with, uh, with what Henry Ford said. Uh, Henry Ford said, uh, if you think you can do it or if you think you can't do it, you can't. Uh, and I was also listening to Aubrey Marcus, who's the owner of uh, On It. Uh, he basically does this thing called the Aubrey Marcus Podcast. And today he was actually reading a book, and, and also with mindset, it's also your identity. So your identity, like my identity as a uh, 21 year old to like a 30 year old was like a rock star. I was I party hard. You know, I no longer have that identity. And he was talking about fear and how it's totally okay to change your identity and become somebody different. You know, down deep inside, you're going to still be the same person, have the same values, hopefully. But there's no reason why you can't completely change and do what you want to do. So I'm in that transition period right now. I'm 45 or 46 in two weeks where I'm like, you know, I, I hustled a lot, I did a lot of things, I had all this experience for 45 years, and now I got the second half of the movies coming on, which is the second half of my life. I want to take on a different identity. Even this morning, I, I asked Dominic, where'd you get your tattoo? You know? So now I'm thinking, okay, my, and I was texting with my niece last night, uh, she's like, you're getting a tattoo? I'm like, yeah, I contemplated it. So now, not that I'm trying to, like, you know, I'm going to make a left turn, but there's other things I want to do. So am I going to be the same guy I was last year? No, I'm constantly, as Tony Robbins says, constantly never ending to prove. So I'm still going to be the same foundational person. I want to take on a little bit of a different identity. As a personal trainer and mind, mindset, and I, I've done numerous events, marathons, so on and so forth. So mindset is huge. What I see with clients, and, and kind of, I guess, going back to what Henry Ford said, the one thing I, I, I hate when I hear is this. Well, I'm going to start. I'm going to start on, on October 1st. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to wait till the new year. Yeah. That's right there. Yeah. You're not going to do it. Absolutely. You're setting yourself up for absolute failure. 1,000%. It's the, when I hear it, I I almost cringe inside. And I'm like, no, don't. No, you need to start now. Right now. Because by October 1st, you're going to be happy you started today. And that, so that's one thing I see, and I think mindset is absolutely huge. 
and it goes both ways, right? It goes negative or it goes positive. Absolutely, and um, along the same lines, um, I have a huge problem when someone says, well, I'll, I'm gonna try. I said, hell no, there's no trying. You're doing or you're not doing. That's right. You're doing or you're not doing. You're making a decision to start now, or you're saying you're gonna put it off one more day after waiting how long. You gotta make a decision and you gotta do more than just try. You're doing or not doing. And, and along with mindset, I'm going to be very frank here. If, if you're overweight or whatever issues you have going on, you're making a conscious decision every time you eat. The same way I am making a con conscious decision to eat X, so are you and so is Dr. Chan. Those people are making that decision to eat Y. Right, and then that's what I say. And I, I, I love this mantra I have. It's called stop, challenge, and choose, okay? So you're about to make a decision and you can stop yourself. And then you've got to challenge yourself to make a decision. Now the decision can go one or two ways. You, you're gonna make a decision no matter what. To go towards something that might not serve your goals or to go uh, away from something that would take you away from your goals. But at the end of the day, you have a decision to make. That, that's tremendous and it falls right in line with mindset. And yep. It totally does. Absolutely. So, so positive thinking and gratitude. You made a comment about that. Can you elaborate on that yeah. a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I've made no secret about gratitude changing my life. I definitely, in my younger years, uh, my, my 30s and my early 40s, had more of a, uh, a victim mentality. Why were these things happening to me? Why is my life not going as planned? Why is this person talking badly about me? And I, I we were in a, a pretty pretty bad place. I had just gotten through a divorce. Um, you know, we were living in a rental. Um, you know, money was tight. And really, I had, nothing to lose and everything to gain. And so one day, my now husband and I, who was my fiance at the time, sat down and read Rhonda Burns' The Secret, and it changed our life. It changed our life, and it really talked about law of attraction and really instilling gratitude into your daily life. And I really was at a spot where I said, well, what else do I have to lose but be grateful for what I have? And that, once I sort of flipped that script in my mind about being grateful for what I did have, while working towards the things I wanted, my whole life opened up, my whole life changed. And I found silver linings in my day and just started every day, I remember this, I started writing every morning just three things down. And I remember in the beginning it was a struggle to write three things. And then again, like everything else, it just became a habit where every day I would expand the list and every day I would expand the list. And now it's like I can't, I fill pages sometimes. And little things, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm, you know, I started by, being grateful for my house, my kids, my husband. But then it became things like I'm, I'm grateful for the person that you know sent me a text today. You know, little things like that. And just, it's again, I, I mentioned earlier about setting your intentions for the day. When you start your day with looking at the positivity in your life and the things to be grateful for, there's no way possible you can have a poor day. I love that. Absolutely love that. No way. Again, no. talking about a choice, just to finish up. Sure. If you have a choice every day to be positive or negative, but it is a choice. It is a choice. So when you decide, make a decision in the morning, today's going to be a good day, and I'm grateful, guess what happens? Even when things go bad, you'll look at things in a positive light. But if you start off by, you know, stubbing your toe and, oh, woe is me, and, you know, I hate my boss, guess what? You're going to bring those circumstances directly to you every single day. Without a doubt. And, and so I never wrote a bad teacher. And um, I did meditate, and I, I, I did some mental things for myself until I started working here. And uh, Dr. Jan actually mentioned to me, do you write a gratitude journal? And I said, I don't. And he said, get a book and write three things down every day that you're grateful for. Doc, would you elaborate on, on yeah, that gratitude uh, journal? It's been 147 days since I started my gratitude journal. Love it. So I've been doing my morning miracle, which was recommended to me by an awesome chiropractor over in uh, Banks. It's also Mr. Olympia's car friend. I thought he put up his book called No Miracle. I read it, and then I didn't know what to write to expect. So the first thing I wrote was like, I'm grateful that I woke up. I'm grateful that I woke up next to my main wife. I'm grateful that I woke up next to my wife in our bed. I'm grateful that I woke up next to my wife in our bed in our home. And then just reviewing that, and this was like a dark part of my life where things were going really bumpy. Not with my wife, that's always been fantastic, but this whole fear bullshit that thing that goes on in your head and your these false evidence and your real things that pop into your head. 
So uh, once I read that and I read it over a couple of times, I said, wow, I mean, what do I really have to complain about? And I went from writing like four lines to, like, like uh, the mayor says, I'm writing the full pages sometimes. And now it's not always what I'm grateful, but sometimes like, you know, this Monday, every Monday, a lot of people have that anxiety. So then yesterday, Monday, I'm like, no anxiety, going to kick ass. And I just wrote things that get done today, and I got all those things done. So you okay. can use the gratitude journal no matter which way you want to use it. The key is just to get some ideas down at the beginning of your day to refocus on your energies and go conquer your day. Harvey D. Absolutely. Absolutely. In your in your social media posts, you're you're always saying the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I think um I think we all have such unlimited potential, but yet we're afraid to kind of, kind of tap into what that is. And so, you know, again, it starts along the lines of every day doing little small things that sort of take you to a higher level. And I like leveling up or um, living above the line, as I like to call it. So again, sending somebody a note just to wish them well, thinking of anybody that's on your heart, reaching out to them, holding a door, buying the coffee for the guy behind you online, you know, asking someone about their day when, you know, maybe they don't want to talk. Doing little things like that every day add up, okay? So sort of leveling up and, and living above the line. Um, and I also find that I love to challenge myself, and I, 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 I like to challenge myself, and I believe in things happening for you, not to you. And when things happen to you, something doesn't go your way, that is when I truly find out what I'm made of and, and who I really am, and I really grow from that. But so many people are afraid to find out what they're really made of. They kind of sit on the sidelines of their own life. They're afraid to take chances. They're afraid to go for the job that they want. They're afraid to get out of a relationship that maybe doesn't serve them. They're afraid to, you know, try something new because they're just scared of failing. Maybe they failed so many times before, but what people fail to realize is they will truly step into the best versions of themselves when they're challenged a little bit and they're asked to do something that's a little bit scary and fearful. I've found that the times that I've had to make life decisions, I have truly stepped into who I was meant to be, you know, um, finding my current husband, saying yes to marrying him, um, leaving a job, a career that, that was just setting, not setting my soul on fire anymore, starting my own business, saying yes to Iron Man when they tapped me to go to Kona, which I was scared out of my mind to do and what would people think of me. When I said yes to those opportunities, it changed my life. And I don't regret one decision. Um, I, I've really become the best version of myself as a result of being scared, but saying yes anyway. That's tremendous. How, how do you feel about setting goals in life? Essential, essential, essential. We gotta know where we're going to, to set a plan of action. And so I, you know, every day I write out my goals. I do my gratitude journal, I write out my goals. I write out my daily goals, I write out my monthly goals, and then I also do my 90-day goals. And I review them every single morning, I revise them as necessary. She even has themes for her I have themes for my goals. Last week. Yes, so thank you. <laughs> my themes, right, so I have my 90-day goals and I have a theme for every 90 days, every goal. You know, so this 90 days, this is my, my theme. And then my next quarter goals, I have a different theme. So, I'm a task oriented person. I find that it keeps me on track. Um, what about you guys? Do you guys like to write out your goals? Oh, absolutely. I got my goals for September, and basically, I thoroughly enjoy checking things off. So, how about you? I, I'm the same way. Uh, even as silly as making checklists for the day, sure. and you keep this, this, this done, whether it's going to the bank or the post office. Or it's our organization and planning. This exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Absolutely. Mary Ellen, biohacking or bio optimization. Yeah. Just tell us what you're doing to keep yourself able to get to the start line of, of, of Well, I'll tell you right now, I'm gonna be coming here, that's number one. Number two is I'm gonna get these recovery boots ASAP because they're killing me, right? They love them, they're the best. Um, I, again, this is not an area that I always excel at. And again, I learned the lesson the hard way. Um, I used to look at things like recovery boots, massage, foam rolling, I don't know, ART as luxuries. 
yet I'm doing these Ironman events every year, and you know, listen, I'm no spring chicken, so you need to do these things, not as luck, they're not luxuries, they're essential. They're essential part of recovery, and then to moving you forward to your next day of training, to your next big block of training, to your next season of training. It's, it's, it's critical, and I, I need to prioritize it more. And so that's one lesson I've really learned this year. Um, it's, it's, it's just as essential as your swimming, biking, running, strength training workout. It's got, and, and nutrition, it's got to be a part of that, that, that training block, for sure. Doc, can you give us some insight on uh, some biohacking? For especially, specifically, for let's, let's sure. I think is it's, you're training harder so you want to recover faster so you can get back out there. Obviously, you can't push past what the body is putting, what the body can actually do, but you can push this, position it in a better way, like wearing these boots. So it takes the body naturally anywhere from 24 to 36 hours to do to push out all this inflammatory waste out of your legs and dump it to your hook nose in the boots. It can take you an hour, an hour and a half. So, especially if you could also use it before you work out. There's other tools you can use, like a PMF pad, which is fantastic, pulse electric magnetic field mat, which thins the membranes of your cells. This way allows the inflammation to move out and cock up, the inflammation to move out and nutrients to move in. Infrared saunas are fantastic. Uh, everybody's into these cryo saunas. I, there's really no research that shows they actually help, but get a, a, a bathtub, fill it up with water and some ice. That will assist dramatically speed up your, your recovery as well because the hydrostatic pressure of that water pushing on your skin. Even foam rolling, things of that nature also. So biohacking doesn't have to be using all these tools. It can also be mindset. It could be uh, it could be um, everyday meditating. That's a biohack that people don't use. It could be surrounding yourself with the proper people. Like uh, another way, if you want to really succeed in life, you know, we had this talk uh, last week. It's uh, if you want to fly with the eagles, you got to stop hanging out with the turkeys. So that's a, also a biohack because yeah. you are hacking your environment, your current situation, and the way to do that is, I want to be with them, so you have to start hanging out with people like them. So you can biohack mentally, you can biohack your career, you can biohack anything. Doc, real quick on the ice bath. Um, at what point in, in somebody's training or recovery, at what point do you recommend they do that? Would that be something? I mean, don't do it immediately right afterward, no. You want, you want that inflammatory response. Inflammatory inflammation is good because it allows the body to heal. So if you just finished your training and it's like 8 o'clock in the morning and you're done, I would wait until like 1 or 2 o'clock. Let the inflammatory cascade kick in. Do not take any, any natural anti-inflammatories like like uh, your, your uh, omega-3s or your you Wait 4 or 5 hours, let the inflammation kick in, and then go ahead, jump in your ice bath, and then take your anti-inflammatories. Thank you very much. Ariel, and anything else you'd like to uh, speak about? Um, I'm just uh, so grateful and honored to be here, guys. You guys, um, just closing about hanging out with the you know, eagles versus the turkeys, I totally agree with what Dr. Jan said. Surrounding yourself with the people who you aspire to be like is part of becoming the best version of yourself. And sometimes that requires letting go of some folks that don't serve your current goals or, or dreams or agenda anymore, and that's sometimes a hard decision to make. But again, Surrounding yourself with good people who have the same vision as you, it's going to help you be the best version of you, for sure. Excellent. Dr. Jan, anything? I'm good. Very good. Again, Mary Ellen is the starter of New Jersey Tri Friends, and it, you know, what's your following? How many people? Yeah, we're almost at 1,000 uh, uh, members on that site, and thank you so much. I really do want to give a shout, quick shout out to the New Jersey Tri Friends community. This community started as a result of the White Hawk Y MCA. Shout out to the Y. Small triathlon club. Oh, gosh, I, it's got to be 10 years ago. We started the Facebook page just as a means of communicating, and it's really become this incredible resource for triathletes in this area. And I'm so inspired every day by the people that are doing amazing things on that page. And um, thank you for joining and contributing to it, every single one of you. And um, it's a wonderful community that you guys are also a part of, so thank you so much. Excellent. You can find the New Jersey Tri Friends on Facebook, and if you're a triathlete, I suggest going there. There is a lot of good information there. And in closing, you've listened to the EPT podcast. Have a great day. Train your brain. Train your body. <laughs>